the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. of the Tommy Abloff Scholarship Committee and the Abloff family, it is my privilege to introduce the 2020 scholarship recipient, Ms. Erin Ahern. Erin carries a 4.52 GPA, ranking her fourth out of 348 seniors at Pine Richland High School. She's a member of the National Honor Society, participates in the school band, in the play and musical, is on student council and mock trial, all while uh, being a member of the varsity tennis team. Here at Hampton Presbyterian Church, she is a counselor for Summer's Best Two Weeks, volunteers for Vacation Bible School, and teaches Sunday School. Next year, she will be attending Villanova University in pursuit of a degree in political science. Good. Congratulations, Erin! Hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. I miss seeing you guys at HPC. I am so honored and truly grateful to be named this year's recipient of the Tom Obloff Memorial Scholarship. Next year, I plan on attending Villanova University to study political science. Again, thank you so much. Hey, welcome to Team Jesus Practice. I'm so glad you're here. Before we get started though, talking about ways that we can practice our faith so that we can grow in our relationship with God, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever practiced anything? I bet you have. Like maybe you play an instrument or you dance. You practice at that, don't you? Just are trying to, to stay healthy and so you're doing some things around your neighborhood like 
riding your bike or running. Or maybe you play on a team and you want to stay sharp for when your team gets together again, so you've been practicing. Get your head in the game. We gotta get it, get it, get it, get it. When we care about something, we practice at it, don't we? We want to we wanna give it our all. Well, the same thing happens when we're on Team Jesus. We get to practice at, at following Jesus, practice in our faith. Now, before we go any further, I just want to make something super, super clear. We're not practicing so that we can say, oh, did this, did this, did this, that means God loves me now. That's not the case at all, because God loves us so, so much. That never changes. But when we practice, we get to draw near to God. We get to know God better. We get to know what makes God happy, what makes God sad, what, what is pleasing to God. And don't we want to know that? If we want to follow God, don't we want to know those things? All right, team, so let's go over our practice plan that'll help us to grow in our faith. One of the things we need to do is we need to just watch for God. God is always at work doing amazing things all the time. So we just need to be aware of it and be paying attention to those kinds of things. Another thing we get to do, we get to talk to God when we pray. How amazing is that? The creator of the entire universe cares about each of us so much that he wants us to talk to him. It doesn't have to be fancy. Just talk to God from your heart. Also, we need to read God's Word. God's Word has some really, really good stuff in it. And there are lots of different versions out there. So find one that you like the best. But it's important that we spend time in God's Word so that we can know God better. Next, oh my gosh, this one's amazing too. We get to worship God. That is a gift that God gives us really when we spend time focusing on who God is and who we are as God's dearly loved children helps us to remember to praise God and to give thanks to God for all he's done. Ooh, this is a fun one. We get to tell others about God's amazing love. That love is so awesome. We don't want to just hold it in for ourselves. We want to make sure that other people know how wonderful God is. And then last but certainly not least, we need to put our faith into action by showing love to others. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? You know what he said? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And also then love your neighbors as yourself. So we need to be thinking of ways that we can show God's love to others. All right, everybody, bring it in. Great work today. I'm so proud of you. And as we go into this week, Let's just keep our eyes fixed on Jesus because he's going to show us the way. All right, let's close in prayer. Put your hands in. Everybody's hands in. All right. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you love us. And we thank you that we get to practice our faith. Help us to love you and to love others. Amen. All right. On one, two, three, we're going to say Jesus loves us. One, two, three. Jesus loves us. Have a great week. I'll see you next time. I will praise the Lord for all his goodness to me. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord and the presence of all his people present in the sight of the Lord is the death of his sins. O oh Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant of oh, the son of your maid servant. You can have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord in the presence 
of all his people in the carts of all the house of the Lord in the Midas. O oh, Jerusalem, praise the Lord. today comes from 1st Peter chapters chapter 1 verses 13 through 25 therefore with minds that are alert and fully sober set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming as obedient children do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance but just as he who called you is holy be so be holy in all you do for it is written be holy because I am holy since you call on the father who judges each person's work imperishably impartially Live out your time as foreigners in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down from you, to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, to the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Ah, it's so nice being here at Hartwood again. It's 
been a long time and I don't know, you know, obviously no concerts for a while. And whether we'll ever be able to have a picnic soon, that'd be nice, you know, maybe sometimes by summertime we'll be able to do that, but it's good to be here. This is quite the place. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just to be able to look out over the scenery is a breath of fresh air. For sure, for sure. Yeah, a lot of folks said last week's sermon was kind of like a breath of fresh air playing that game. You know, it was kind of fun. <laughs> it really was a blast. And if we remember correctly, that whole thing, remember that image that was there about Jesus being our guard that was leading us out like some kind of Marine? I thought that was such a cool image, man, that he's, you know, taking us through it into our salvation. Yeah, that, I really liked that um, image of the movie at... I forget what you called it, but were you talking about Hacksaw Ridge? Yes, 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 that's the one! I couldn't remember the name! That's exactly the movie! Wasn't that so jacked? Such a great movie. I mean, that well dude was done. amazing! Mm -hmm. Yeah! What a great story and testimony. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there he is. So, you know, he's leading us into salvation. That's the cool part. And then we come to our text today, you know, and that's, that's the awesome part. We look at our text in 1 Peter. And there's yeah, there's, uh, there's a large therefore in the text. And as we all know, therefore, we always need to ask the question, what's it there for? <laughs> Absolutely. So, so Peter's making this major transition. After he mentions the reality that Jesus is on this major rescue mission for us, for our salvation, he then says, well, because that's happened, this is what should be the follow-up. You know, you should, and it says, well, I love this word. It's like straight out of Job. Gird up your loins. You know, prepare yourself. Get ready. We're in a track meet here. That's the first thing he says. And then the second thing he says is be sober-minded. You know, kind of having a clear head. Don't let yourself get so kind of thrown off the game. Be able to look at things and assess them properly without becoming so emotionally overwhelmed by them. Like, wow. And if we remember, you know, the context of that, it was, there was persecution that was going on for those guys. And Peter's trying to give them good words of comfort, saying, you know, here you've been saved. Now, let's prepare yourself. He's not saying sit back in your lazy boy. He's doing the words of Job, you know. Let's go, <laughs> gird yourself, get ready. Pull up your loins and let's go for a track meet and let's start running and, you know, and uh, be clear minded about what you're about to do. And that's why I thought it'd be so critical for us to come to this place, Hartwood Acres. Yeah. And you may be thinking, well, what's Hartwood Acres got to do with <laughs> being prepared and, and uh, having a clear mind and all that kind of jazz? Well, you know, Mary Flynn Lawrence was the one who inherited money from her dad, who was a Pennsylvania senator, an amazing Pennsylvania senator, way back in the turn of the 20th century. And she inherited some pretty big clams. Yeah, wasn't she, uh, didn't she have something to do with the 19th Amendment? Yes, she did! <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, because she was a senator's daughter, she was so keyed into all that kind of political stuff and was so hyped into it and thought, well, wait a minute, women need the right to vote as well. And so sure enough, yeah, they <laughs> right, they didn't have no right to vote at that point. And so there she was, was working behind the scenes. She was this woman that just grew into this expression of elegance. And when she married John, she and John commissioned an architect to, to design and build this place. It's modeled after some manor in Oxfordshire, England. It's, beautiful place you know you look at this you're like holy moly it's not no shack you know <laughs> and, and and so here it's placed on this piece of property that's 629 acres was the original acreage for here and you'd think okay this was a beautiful little gentleman's farm that she had put together you know just to be able to tinker around and play no way no way she was here to do some serious work she didn't just let life come and feed her bonbons. You know, as I look at it and as I do the research and study on her, she really was engaged. You know, her dad was first involved with the Christian Children's 
or the children's crippled children's home in Pittsburgh and was instrumental in helping that get started because these kids had no place to go for right, you know, physical therapy or addressing their, their needs physically. So he got that established and, and Mary coming in as a child was part of that. And then as she grew older, she became an amazing philanthropist for this. So this place, no doubt, was constantly like a hub for thinking through how are we going to create the next fundraiser? What are we going to do to, to support the needs of the crippled children's home? Which is a phenomenal exercise there. And on top of that, no doubt, she had her friends here to be able to talk about how do we strategize toward the uh, 19th Amendment and getting that passed you know, and be able to get women to have the right to vote. So there is some real work going on here from that vantage point, just, just out of this building. But beyond that, you know, she loved horses. And this place became known as a, a place for the equine sciences. I don't know about you, but I've always thought that every kid should learn how to ride a horse. I think it's just without a doubt. They just, they should, because there's something powerful about working with an animal like that. That, just that huge animal and being able to recognize that symbiotic kind of relationship that you have with that animal as you ride. And a lot of people don't realize that it really is an athletic event. If you've ever done like combined training or dressage or, you know, a steeplechase or they've had fox hunts here. You know, there's over 30 miles of trails that they put into this place. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of ride. And they had a show ring down there and they do all these shows all the time. And, and even now to this day, they do the polo. And uh, so if you come and you're going to ride, you just don't hop on a horse. You know, <laughs> You've got to discipline yourself. So the fun thing here is this whole idea of looking at what the command that Peter's doing of girding up your loins, preparing yourself, right? And that whole idea of, you know, how is it that your mind has been cleared for this? You know, that you are focused upon what you need to be doing. I think this would be a great chance for for them to think about this. Yeah. You know, how have they been preparing themselves? How have they made sure that they have this sober mind and can think through it? Because we've been in the midst of some challenging stuff where we need to be prepared and we need to be sober minded. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when we think about that text, as we're coming back into this, the one key aspect that Peter was communicating <clears throat> to the Church of Asia Minor, as we go through that therefore, he says, yeah, you're going to prepare yourself, you get ready, and you've got to be sober-minded, because you set your hope. That's the, that's the real deal right there. He's saying, you come, therefore, here's what you know, right? You're going to do these things. This is part of it, but you set your hope on Jesus Christ. He's establishing that, saying that's where our hope resides as we step into the job that we have to do. You know, it's funny because when I was working on the ranch in Nebraska and we had those six to 8,000 head of cattle and 20,000 acres all spread out before us and who knows how many quarter horses that we had out there. You know, <laughs> there was a job, you know, that we were working all the time out there, you know, it was just constant. <laughs> Well, there always is a job that has to be done, isn't there, Ted? There's no question. It's, it's a never-ending job. Daily, you had tasks that had to be done. You had to attend to these things, or else the animals would be hurting, or the, the equipment would break down. There's always a job. And this is precisely what Peter is telling the church of, of Asia Minor and to us today. You know, here we are sitting, th thinking that we're sitting in the lap of luxury, but this place actually worked and worked hard. You know, to train themselves to be good riders, that takes a lot of work. 
you know, to be able to write an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, you just don't wake up one morning and decide, okay, I'm going to write this Constitution, right. you know, this amendment. You know, this takes a lot of work, you know. Here you are, you're in seminary, you know, you can tell us about the papers that you write. How many of them can you really pull off this as a fly-by-night all-nighter? Not too many, you know. I mean, unless I have to. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's serious work. And so Peter starts to outline for the church, and even for us today, three specific tasks that we really need to be focused upon as we step into our life of faith. Yeah, and the, the first task was one that would have been huge for him. You know, growing up, this Jewish boy, he would have learned this as he was growing up, the holiness code yeah. found in <laughs> Leviticus, right? He says, be holy for God's holy. You think about God, the creator of, of yeah. all this, the universe. Right. Yeah, he's quoting right out of Leviticus 11, right. you know. And 19. I thought it was 11. Well, we can find it out no, later. we'll find it out. I know there's 11 in there somewhere. Maybe it's 19 verse 11. I think it might be. Yeah, it could be like Hacksaw Ridge again, you know? <laughs> but anyways, like this, this whole chapter in Leviticus just outlines these different things that you're supposed to be doing. And these, you know, these jobs, like we were talking about jobs on a, on right. a farm. And as you're, right. you're doing these things, you're living into this life of holiness. And you know what? That reminds me because here, you know, Casey's sitting on this picnic blanket you know and and that dream that peter had because he was living into this holiness kind of thing and here comes all this food down out of the blanket and the angel says peter rise kill and eat he's like i ain't touching that that's all unclean and the lord says hey don't tell me what's clean and what's not (laughs) you know and so this whole idea of you know Peter coming to an awareness of how do we live into this holiness and what does that look like? Because sometimes, you know, what's the downside of what happens to people who get so caught up in this pursuit of holiness? Well, you, you become self-righteous. Mm-hmm. And the other side of it is equally dangerous, right? Right. Because if we live too deeply in grace... Yeah, then you're, then you're not doing anything. You're just thinking, okay, like, I'm going to be forgiven for all of this, so I just go out and do this stuff. It doesn't really matter. And your faith just remains as an immature baby the yeah, whole time. Exactly. There's no maturation to it. So, you know, that's I think, is, you know, a critical aspect for us to think about. And I want us to take a moment right now to think through how is it that we have been pursuing a life of holiness Where is it that we're looking to live into that life of holiness? Where is it that maybe we have been a little too expressive in our pursuit of holiness, that we think that we're holier than thou, or maybe somebody has said that to us, right? And then the other side is to look at where is it that we understand grace, and have we been a little too lackadaisical in our pursuit of holiness because we've leaned so deeply on grace? And I want us to think about those aspects. You know, that next aspect of the job that needs to be done that Peter outlines for the church is this uh, imperative. Each one of these are imperatives, you know, that you have a life of holiness, be holy, uh, because God is holy. And this second imperative, which is just like working on a ranch or a working farm, there is no negotiating with these things. You have to do these things, you know, or else there's trouble. And, And Peter says to the church of Asia Minor, conduct yourselves with reverence with fear you know this is the the uh, reality that how is it that we are looking at our conduct you know and as we look at the early church at the time and what they were surrounded by in their cultural norms you know there's peter is giving them a huge challenge 
to look into what is their lifestyle choices and what are they doing that you know, reflects a life that is dedicated to loving God and showing this deep sense of reverence or fear as it's written in scripture toward the reality of who God is and ultimately the reason why we have that sense of fear or reverence is because the blood of Christ has ransomed us, right? This is huge. You know, if you want to know a motivational factor of why I need to kind of put my conduct into check, maybe just think about what happened, oh, as we think two weeks back now on Good Friday. <laughs> you go, whoa, okay, God took on flesh, took on all this suffering, died on the cross, so the relationship would be restored between myself and God. And all that to recognize the selflessness of what Jesus did of emptying himself, all the more would recognize the value of, whoa, where is my conduct? Just as if you were to come up here to Hartwood and Mary invited you to, you know, an opportunity to work on the 19th Amendment or, or even to go riding, right, or to work on, you know, something for a combined training or a dressage or some show, you know, you're not going to come dressed as a schlep. You know, you're not going to come to her place and not be at all prepared for that and, and just kind of take advantage or feel like you own the joint. You're going to kind of check yourself at the door, you know, and say, I better make sure my P's and Q's are in order. Because you got to recognize who it is that's invited you to this place in the first place. What she comes with. You know, the credential that she holds. So you're not going to treat her like she's less than you or that she's some best bud. You're going to recognize her as, whoa, she has got some authority here and has opened the pathway for me to be a part of this. And so likewise for us, right, how is it that we approach God? You know, God welcomes us just like, you know, the prodigal son story. There's the father waiting for us to come. He has, throws his arms wide open to receive his son. Even runs out to greet us. Yeah. But still, the son shows the necessary you know, humility. It says, I'm not worthy to be here, man. <laughs> and, and so likewise for us, when we think about, we're really not worthy to be in the presence of God. And that's why we have that sense of reverence that fear of recognizing it's nothing that I've done on myself to be here to receive this invitation. It's purely by God's grace that I've been able to come. And so that should regulate the conduct, the behavior, the things that I do, the, the decisions that I make, how I interact in society. All of that should dictate how, what my manner of life is going to be like before the presence of a holy God. Just as if, if I came into this place, I wouldn't come in here with my muddy shoes and prop them up on the beautiful 18th century coffee table that's there and tell somebody, hey, bring me an iced tea. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't do that. I would make sure that I've pretty well got my act together to the best of my capacity and, and come into that environment. So that is something I want us to think even now at this point. How is it? that we've been conducting ourselves with a sense of reverence before the holy God who has ransomed you, right, from sin and the impact of sin and has given you the ability to embrace life. Let's take a moment to think about it. And uh, the third commandment that Peter gives us is uh, to earnestly love with a pure heart. And I love that word, like earnest, and like the zeal, like you just, you just gotta love them. And it's really a cool concept because it's not only a command, it's, 
it's a re response. Like we are to respond to God's amazing love by loving others. And I think at this time that kind of might be hard, you know, when you're we're <laughs> absolutely and you're just sick of one another. Oh, people but, are getting so fed up. Yeah. <laughs> but like that is our response and it's right. just like this this great kind of intense love for one another. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I love about this. You know, this Peter's bringing us to an end. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. You know, that truth that we've been sanctified. You know, that we've been rescued. You know, that Christ has come. That's the truth that we, we live in. And that it shows that essence of humility of, of how we are to be. You know, as Christ has modeled that and and sacrifice for our sake so the relationship would be there. And, he, and then he goes on, he says, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. You know, wow! You know, and you know, we come here to this place yeah. and what do we know? Well, I think Mary is such a great example of this because she did so many amazing things. I mean, of course, I'm super biased. I love the 19th Amendment. I love the right to vote. <laughs> Big shout out. Thank you to her. That's right. But she also like ran that charity for the crippled children, and she even adopted two children. And so like to come to this place with this woman who had such a great heart to love others, right? it's really, it makes a lot of sense to me. Absolutely. And... So for us, as we're here together on this day, as we've been thinking about this and looking at Peter's text and recognizing the need to, to pursue holiness for Christ is holy, God is holy, expects holiness from us, and that we want to check our conduct at the door, you know, see how is it that we're going to behave. And this, this command slash response, you know, of loving one another earnestly you gotta love that that adjective or adverb you know just holy moly you know you just get this sense of you you wake up in the morning with a with a drive right i want to do this i want to love you know this is i'm gonna have this nothing's gonna stop me from doing this so you have these three jobs that we have to do when we come out onto the working farm here and when we go out into our working lives that those three things we want to keep on thinking about on our daily checklist of jobs to do. But recognize that it's all bathed in a sense of God's grace as well. So you know, as a family group, I want you to, or as an individual even, take a moment and think about how is it that you're going to earnestly love somebody this week? It was kind of cool how Peter closes down this letter to the church. Well, it doesn't close down, but this thought that he has right there right. of chapter 1 before he goes into chapter 2 of referencing this quote from Isaiah chapter 40. Right. And we love Isaiah chapter 40. And, and here's this, as the flower fades and the grass withers, you know, so everything kind of just passes away. But right. the word of the Lord endures forever you know that's such a cool image when you think about that because so many times we place our confidence in things that will just dissolve away right and peter's reminding the, the church of, of uh, asia minor galatia and pontia say hey you know put your confidence in god's truth that's where we need to be in this you know we can't allow ourselves to be wowed by some physical plant or some other thing that is just going to fade away eventually. You know, the other side of that too, I think, is what he's communicating is that life is very precious and very right. short. And how is it that we're living our lives? You know, are we taking each day and being very purposeful with that day? Because we're temporal. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But, uh, you know, and I think about uh, 
what this leads into for the for the next statement that Peter's about oh, to yeah. set up. Oh uh, yeah, you know? chapter two, right? I mean, I just we've been here a little bit, and I've seen some photographers going by, and even my family came, and we got our pictures taken here, right? Right. Oh yeah. And in chapter two, it's this awesome image. Right, this beautiful spiritual house that we're getting built into, much like people love coming to see this beautiful house, right? And it all rests on that cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly where we are. Now, this is what we do. How is it that we're living into a recognition that we have a deep appreciation for things done right and done well? And here's a beautiful mansion here in our community that reminds us of that. Not only has it been done right and done well philosophically in a lot of ways and other ways in which it's been made manifest to us, but more so it communicates a reminder to us of the spiritual truth that who we are to be before the presence of a holy God, even as we recognize, as Peter writes to the Church of Asia Minor, you're being built into a gorgeous spiritual home. It's good to come before the presence of God and to be in prayer. And so at this time, we're going to take ourselves through the, the infamous acts of prayer, the adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. So to begin, let's uh, express the adoration part of this uh, prayer discipline as we reflect upon who God is and why we love him as much as we do, even in the midst of a time like this, we have confidence, right? So let us give praise to God in prayer. Lord God Almighty, we come before you with great praises. And so even now, in this time, hear our prayer as we extend our prayer of adoration for who you are how you've revealed yourself to us as our only comfort and source for life. Even the birds sing of God's praises as we hear them in the background. And let us now be in a moment to pray a prayer of confession. Go to this second part of the prayer. Having thought about how awesome and wonderful God is, we turn to ourselves and realize that compared to God, we're broken people. We're in need of God's grace and, and mercy. We've done the things that we know we shouldn't do, or we haven't done some of the stuff that we know we should do. Whereas God is always faithful, we find ourselves unfaithful. And so knowing that God loves us and offers us forgiveness in that clean slate, we go boldly to confession lifting up those things, knowing that we will find a Father that loves us and forgives us. I encourage you now to think of those things that you need to confess. As we continue our prayer, we now have time to share the things that we are thankful for. In a time where there seems to be a lot of hard things happening, there are still wonderful things we can give thanks to God for. Let us now take time to lift up those things that we are grateful for. Good and gracious God, we give thanks to you for this day. We thank you for the rain and the beautiful flowers that the rain brings. 
Lord, we thank you for those people who are hard at work so that our lives may go on as normal as possible. God, we give thanks for those who are working in grocery stores, gas stations, drive throughs and pharmacies. We thank you for the UPS, FedEx, post office, and Amazon people. We thank you for those brave men and women who are working day and night to help our hospitals run efficiently. God, we thank you for technology that allows us to communicate and to be involved in our community. As we go through this coming week, I pray we are able to see all of the good you do amidst the bad we encounter. God, we know you are bigger than the coronavirus. We thank you that you do not leave us alone at this time. As Paul writes from a Roman prison to the church of Philippi, he tells the people to rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. And he says, let your requests be made known with thanksgiving. And so we've given our thanks, and now we come before the Lord to express that which weighs heavy upon our hearts, seeking his hand to intervene and to reveal the hope that is only contained through him. Let us pray. As we finish our time of prayer together, let's join our voices together as family and friends, even though we can't hear each other in our own separate places. But by God's Spirit, we are united as one. And so we join together, reciting the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, guys. I just wanted to share with you an awesome announcement. Uh, this past Wednesday, I went before CPM and they uh, passed me, so I am now officially certified ready, which is super exciting because this was the last big obstacle between me and ordination. So it doesn't mean I'm ordained yet, but it is a huge step and one of the harder steps. So I'm just, ah, I came so excited and I really wanted to share this with you because you guys have uh, been my support system from day one. Not only are you my field ed church this year, but you're my home church. And uh, I just wanted to share this awesome news with you. The glory goes to God, but a big thank you to everybody who has just shown me so much love and support as I've been on this ordination journey. Thanks, guys. Love you. The wonderful thing that uh, we see unfolding here before us during this time of our harbor at home, shelter in place, or even lockdown. To see the splendor of how humanity still finds a way to show compassion and care. Yeah, there's evidence of things that seem a little bit harsh, but more than anything, 
you see indicators of people taking the extraordinary step to make sure that those who are disenfranchised or unavailable to get out or even to be able to visit, things are being done. And that's a great thing. And even seated here, it's a reminder to me of those who have a larger vision for being able to provide a space or even a beautiful little aesthetic that helps people recognize, yeah, it's the extra little touch here and there it is an indicator of value, appreciation, and being able to show, I care. It was interesting, just as getting ready to sit down to video this, I don't know if the bluebirds have made their way back, but there was a mama and, and daddy bluebird perched on the top of the birdhouse behind me over the top of my shoulder here. <clears throat> and, oh boy, what a wonderful testament to how God continues to provide and a reminder to us. Consider the birds of the air. Do not worry. And so even now, my friends, we continue to support the work of the church because here out of HPC, we have done some amazing things to affect positive influence for organizations within the city and even around the world to continue to do the work that they need to do. And even our staff has continued to be vigilant, to provide top quality care and uh, expression of love, and even to engage in ways that think creatively as to what we can do next. Keep the, the staff in your prayers. Keep these organizations that we support in your prayers. And ultimately, continue to support this church as we reach out to the lives of others. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for how you have blessed us, for the provision that you have given to us. Yes, we consider the birds of the air, and we even look at the lilies, and we know that there's nothing that compares to the lily or the birds are always being tended to and this is because of your tender provision and so even now Lord through this time where quite possibly we we get overwhelmed by the circumstances of the situation and even the confusion but we're all trying to find our way but ultimately we rest in your provision and so Lord use the gifts that we provide even to our dear church continue to affect positive change and to be able to reflect the mercy that you have so lavished upon us through your son Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We sing in jubilation adoration to our joyful King. You are spinning you are singing zealous love over all your children.
these lads Liz who once was dead Shout with joy your deathless voices Child of God lift up your head Friends, we know that our hope is set in Jesus Christ. That's what Peter reminds us, and we take confidence in that reality. So even as you have opportunity to go out into the world, remember, be safe, but all the more, remember that you were enfolded by the love of God. And as you hunker down in your home, even though there may be times where you've been pushed to the limit, or you're getting a little bit exhausted or weary of this whole situation. Know again that God has enfolded you and gives you the peace that is needed. Friends, we gather here virtually knowing that our hope is set in Jesus Christ. So go forth from this place, this time of worship, with that assurance of God's love and radiate that good news to the people with whom you have contact. Go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, let the people of God say, Amen.